teachers vary, you know, they're kind of on a range from strict and tight and at the other end, yeah, loose, loosey goosey. I'm probably more toward the loosey goosey end. My kind of theory of parenting and teaching is big pasture, real fences, particularly with regard to impact on others, right? In terms of people's choices about what they find most valuable for themselves, to take notes or not take notes, to engage the chat or not engage the chat, I'm, I err on the side of trusting people, adults here, autonomous. See for yourself what works for you. That comes out of my own background somewhat uh, in the human potential movement, which is pretty loosey-goosey, and also my own nature as a pretty independent, self-directed individual who respects autonomy in others as well. That's that's me. So that's how I'm about the chat, but it opens up a much bigger question, doesn't it? About how we react to the thoughts and words and deeds of other people. And there's a lot of that going around these days, <laughs> including in my mind, <laughs> definitely including in my wife's and my conversations about the political moment, the state of the world, what our kids are doing, what they're not doing that they ought to be doing, that we think, et cetera. So how can we be about that? And I want to um, enter into a kind of a, a fairly Buddhist reflection about the things in others that they think or say or do that stir us up, in particular related to a sense of unpleasantness and aversion. Uh, and, and in particular, that aspect of the sense of things as unpleasant in terms of their hedonic tone, distinct from pleasant, uh, moving into uh, that form of aversion, which, has, which is fear that has to do with anxiety or withdrawal rather than anger, which I've talked about the last several times, that responds to what's unpleasant, that, that uh, engages aversion, acts out aversion, with, that in ways that are more, that move against rather than away from that which one finds unpleasant. Right? So you might think about something that's been bugging you lately, or even right now, okay? anything. And the typical process in the mind, which is designed to do, so, you know, thank you, Mother Nature. Thank you, evolution. Thank you, 600 million years of designing a nervous system that has, you know, culminated so far in the extraordinary human brain uh, for survival purposes. So routinely, when something happens, so maybe someone said something on the chat you don't like, it's unpleasant, and you have aversion to it, okay? And maybe it, it particularly bothers you, okay? Three things tend to happen. Maybe uh, somebody says something to you in your, in your regular life. You read something, okay? So the first thing that happens automatically almost in the mind is it takes a very dynamic, complicated, swirly collection of events which could be what's happening inside the mind of another person, their attitude maybe toward you, you think, or the words they say, or the things they do, the behaviors they're engaged in, takes all that, the brain takes all that and turns it into a thing. It essentializes it, reifies it in a fancy term, thingifies it, thing. Rather than being cloud-like and swirly and dynamic and compounded and impermanent and all that, it's a thing. That's step one. Step two, this thing, so now it's been essentialized and thingified. This thing is that bad. Right? It's that consequential. It's that full of impact. It's that big a violation of a norm. It's that bad. So there's an evaluation that comes in. Okay? That's step two. Evaluation of some kind, charged often, about something that seems like a thing. Which then, in the third step, now that we've established that it's a thing, a thing that is this bad, 
this bad, right? I have a position about my view, my stand, my plan, my retort, my rebuke, my my own view about them. I have a position about it. I am this position. That's the normal process, right? Often happens in less than a second. Well, boom. Pick your favorite example. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you see someone in your home and they, they, you know, maybe there's a familiar kind of tension or conflict between you and another person. You're managing it. You know, you're okay. But then suddenly, boom, they say something or you give you, they give you that look that just drives you wild. <clears throat> there you are, right? Thingified s- stimulus. Second, about which there is this judgment of badness for which uh, I um, have a uh, reaction. I am that reaction. But here's a question. The Buddha asked this question. He asked, in terms of these three, is it really a thing? Is it really brick-like or is it more cloud-like? This is the fundamental Buddhist teaching of shunyata, of emptiness. Things exist in cloud-like ways. Many parts, swirling, dynamically changing. First question, is it really a thing? Or is it more of a process, a swirl? Second, is it really that bad? Is it really that bad? And third, do you need to be a self about it? Do you need to identify with the views arising in your mind about it? Do you need to take a firm position about it? Do you need to be this position, be this view, be this reaction, rather than having a view or position or reaction arising in your mind? Right? How solid is it? How thingified is it? Right? How bad is it really? And can you be spacious and disidentified? with regard to it, rather than um, selfing about it, taking it personally, getting personally identified with a position about it. The Buddha's analysis, by the way, on the second question of how bad is it actually Uh, is summarized in his teaching about the first and the second dart. This may be familiar to some. I'll summarize it briefly. In this teaching, he pointed out that certain things in this life have inherent, inevitable, physical, or emotional pain. You drop a brick on the foot of a Buddha, it's going to hurt. All right? And... um, Similarly, you lose a friend, you lose a loved one, or maybe there's a um, sense of, uh, you know, just alarm or sorrow or compassion for the suffering of others. That's the first art of life. It's inherently unpleasant. We cannot escape first arts. We can minimize them, but we cannot escape some. Then there's the second art in which we take what is objectively this bad, whatever the first art is. It really is that bad. But then what we do is we add our reactions to it. We make it even worse. It's really horrible. Or we start adding um, different layers of reactivity to what happened. You know, it was naturally uh, wounding that some other person used that word. You know, multiple people would have felt wounded by it. It really was a first dart. But then we turbocharge our reactions to it because it's the 10th time that person said it, or it's the 10th time something like that has happened in our life, or it reminds us of our childhood when that happened a lot. 
And so what was, you know, on the bad scale as a first dart was like a two, hits a certain turbocharger amplifier inside her own mind, and it feels like a seven. Mm. Okay. And then there's situations. This is very interesting. There's not a first dart. Actually, it's not even a, there's no second dart needed. And there's not even a first dart. There's no dart at all. But we react to it. Right? Um, and so, by the way, if you've lost me on your screen, somehow Tom became, you know, foregrounded. Just go back to the gallery view and then, then you'll see me. Uh, and I think, Tom, I don't know why, I'm going to do what's called, I think I'm spotlighted. I don't know. I've spotlighted me for everyone, I guess. Okay. So I'm going back to speaker view. Hey, Tom, why don't you turn off your camera for a little bit? And then I go back to gallery. All right, we're figuring it out. Okie doke. Pin the video for Rick. All right, I'm going to, thanks, Hawkeye. Pin my video. All right, I'm pinned. There you have it. For better or worse, great. Okay, good. So, right? But what about no dart? What about situations where, honestly, they did something but it doesn't have any material impact on you or anyone you care about, right? They're just doing it. Doesn't hurt you. Like, for example, I taught a retreat several years ago, and one of the guidelines of it was, you know, don't talk to other people on retreat. Now, it happened that there was a couple on retreat who, um, and this was a, in a rustic setting, so people would camp together if they wanted to, they could do that. This couple camped with each other. And I happen to know them. I happen to know that they have a deep practice. They're on the retreat. And halfway through the retreat, as a teacher, uh, I was the primary teacher, got a note from someone who said, you know, I saw so-and-so, this couple, uh, on a bench, you know, like, hundred yards away, and they were holding hands and talking with each other. You shouldn't let them do that. Well, I would just ask the question in terms of the, is it a dart at all that they did that actually for you? Does it have a material impact on you in any significant way? There's a, a kind of a lovely poem. Uh, I'm in a Altered a little bit from memory, but it's the, the gist is the same. Basically, it's from Woman, I think, anyway. It goes like this. Um, showers in springtime, hot sun in summer, leaves falling in fall, snow in the wintertime. If you make nothing in your mind, for you, it is always a good season. In other words, is, are showers in the springtime a first start at all? Is bright sun in the summer a first start? Is falling leaves in the autumn a first dart, is snow in the wintertime inherently a first dart? Or do we make it into a dart in our reactions to it? So these are, this is a way to think about, it might seem a little abstract or conceptual, but this is the, a, a big Buddhist offering having to do with insight. The word in Pali, the language of early Buddhism for insight is vipassana. Having insight into, do I need to turn this into a thing? Do I need to make it a second dart event? Or is there even a first dart here at all? And do I need to self it? Do I need to take it personally? Do I need to get identified with my reactions to it that still arise in my mind, still arise in awareness, etc.? This is really useful, including for things that bug us. And with practice, with practice, we become closer and closer in real time. You know, it's understandable that there's this time process in which initially we can't do it at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? We are just hijacked. I think, isn't there like an autobiography in Alcoholics Anonymous, My Life in Five Chapters, something like chapter one? I walk down a street, there is a big hole. I fall in the hole. I cannot get out. Chapter two. Somehow I get out of the hole. I walk down the street. I know there's a hole, but I still walk into it. 
I can't get out. Chapter three, um, uh, I walk down the street, I fall in the hole, I can't get out. Somebody comes along and helps me get out. Chapter four, I walk down the street, I know there's a hole, and I walk around the hole. Chapter five, I walk down a different street. So the opportunity through Vipassana, through insight into our own reactivity, is to ask ourselves sometimes, is it really a hole? <laughs> <laughs> or is there a simple way to just walk around it or even choose a different street? Guarding the sense doors is a phrase that I offered last week as a fundamental teaching from the Buddha that we guard our eyes. If, for example, that couple in the distance who are holding hands and talking bothers you, uh, there's an easy solution to that. Look away, right? Look away. Or maybe even add to that a sense of, well, doesn't hurt me materially. Uh, whatever they do, they do. Or maybe even there's a little lesson in it for me. Like I look at them doing that and, you know, I feel really good about maintaining my own noble silence. That, you know, by contrast, I can say, okay, they're doing that, whatever. That helps me feel even gladder than ever about my own practice and my own maintenance of the, the rules on this retreat. Okay. So, like I said, it's a zero dart. And it might even be a blessing. So in effect, we have these different categories, right? Like second darts, first dart, no dart, blessing. We have opportunities through insight, through vipassana, in how we see things. And we also have opportunities for vipassana in <clears throat> how we, um, whether we're claiming something as our own, whether we're getting caught up in our own sense of personality and um, taking things personally. Now, infusing all this reflection, this consideration, it's really important to take into account bias. There are many kinds of bias. For good reason, there's a um, heightened attentiveness that's long overdue to racial bias. Certainly in America, where I live, probably elsewhere in the world too. That's a kind of bias. There are other kinds of bias as well, not to in any ways seem to minimize racial bias. And one of the classic hardwired biases we have is what I call paper tiger paranoia. We are designed biologically when faced with two kinds of mistakes in the wild. First kind being we think there's a threat, but there's actually no threat. We think there's a saber-toothed tiger in the bushes about to eat us but there's really no tiger there. That's a mistake. A second kind of mistake is to think that everything's fine, no threat, while in fact, the tiger is there getting ready to jump. What's the cost of the first mistake? Needless anxiety, all right? What's the cost of making the second mistake? No more mistakes forever. So we are designed to avoid the second mistake by making the first one time and time again. So we're very vulnerable to fear. We're very vulnerable to feeling threatened. And you can see the ways in which our vulnerability to feeling threatened and intimidated um, has been used at all scales, <laughs> whether it's kindergarten playgrounds or family living rooms or corporations or countries uh, throughout history. Uh, our vulnerability to fear uh, is really conspicuous and can be easily manipulated. That's why I think it's very important to uh, deal with real threats, take action appropriately, while not letting you, yourself be intimidated into thinking that it's threat level orange when it's really much more like green for you on this day. So taking into account that bias the fear bias, which is an aspect of a larger negativity bias that I've talked about, which is supported by a great deal of research, in which we're kind of designed to scan for bad news, over-focus upon it, over-react to it, over-remember it, and get sensitized to um, the sense of anxiety and aversion and negative emotions broadly, become increasingly sensitized to that over time. So it's important to take that into account. 
And I think be very judicious and keep it that negativity bias and that paper tiger paranoia in mind as you engage Vipassana, as you engage insight into your own reactions to, is it really so brick-like? <laughs> is it really such a solid thing? Is it really that bad? And do I, got, do I have to take it so personally? Keep this bias in mind as you engage this reflection. And I think it can be very helpful to apply this very systematic, grounded in the Dharma, um, way of reflecting on your own reactions. And as I was starting to say, in the beginning, we'll reflect on our reactions years later. <laughs> you know, I'm reflecting on stuff today that happened when I was a kid a long time ago. I'm reflecting still today on things that happened when our kids were kids 10, 15, or more years ago, uh, 20 years ago, or more, you know? So, and with practice, we get better and better at being in real time. So increasingly, things happen, and more and more in real time, within seconds, we recognize their empty, swirling, cloud-like nature. Within seconds, we uh, are engaging the shock absorbers that have us feel the first dart of it without adding second, third, fourth, fifth dart reactions to it within seconds. And within seconds, we start to watch the tendency arising to take it so personally and to get so identified with our views about it, our case against that other person. And we, within seconds, disengage. That becomes more and more our trait our habit. That becomes more and more who we are. But it takes practice. It takes repetition again and again and again and again and again. So I'm going to finish up now by just adding a couple of points, and then I'll take questions through the chat. I think I'm not going to take questions live today. I find that it was really helpful for me to take questions and comments primarily through chat, because then I can respond more succinctly to things and summarize a variety of things together. But from time to time, I'll still open it up to bring other voices into the room. Um, so I've spoken so far about one of several major ways to practice with the things that we find unpleasant, aversive, and scary. The way I've focused so far is primarily through insight, through understanding, through reflection, through wisdom that becomes increasingly the habit of your heart. Additionally, I want to certainly name that it's important to take action. For example, if you don't like the couple holding hands in the distance, look away. Or don't walk down that trail, because who knows who might be holding hands on the bench on the other side of that meadow. Right? Take action as best we can, including for very real things. I'm, again, I'm not minimizing real darts at any scale. Take action. That's, of course, important. Another thing that's important, in addition to insight and action, which I've talked about so far, is relationships, connection, friendship, uh, which could be summarized in the teaching from Shelley Taylor, as, as I said earlier at UCLA, tend and befriend. One way to manage that which we find unpleasant and aversive and scary is to do the best we can to take care of others, especially if those others are being impacted by what is unpleasant, aversive, and scary, tending to them. And befriend, form alliances, reach out to allies, be an ally to others, hang out with friends, you know, befriend, connect. Metta, have loving kindness, have compassion. Mudita, have joy for the happiness of others, even if it's not a happiness you personally share in. You can still be happy for their sake. Okay, so that gives us path of insight, path of action, path of relationship, and there is the path of calm. Calming the body, calming the mind, as I talked about in the meditative practice. Next week, I'm gonna explore other ways to really rest in a growing trait, a sense of resilient calm in the core of your being, around which sometimes you're going to be irritated or worried or rattled or hurt 
or for, you know, stunned, but in the core of your being, increasingly as a kind of inner sanctuary that you can rest in, right? So I'll talk about that more next time, but I just want to name that as another path, the path of, of calm. It's very useful for the things that we find aversive and scary. Calming the body, finding a, gen- not a numbing, but a calm, calm strength in the core of our being. And then the last path, and they're not mutually exclusive, I'm just naming them, is really the path of positive emotion. Alongside that which frightens us or hurts us or pains us, acknowledging what is authentically true about that, genuinely true about that, what else is true? Can there be pleasure in the body in wholesome ways? Eating, walking, moving, smelling, tasting, hearing, seeing. Can there be things inside you that are going well, including just the functioning of awareness and your own personal practice? The path of positive emotion alongside that which we find upsetting and and worrisome. These are major ways to practice. I focused mainly tonight on insight, but I want to, you know, acknowledge it alongside everything else. Okay. So that's my talk, for better or worse, and I hope it was calming. (laughs) And I'm going to take a quick look at um, comments that have come in. Oh, wonderful. So many wonderful comments. Great. All right. So, so many good things. Um, So... One, multiple questions have come in, very understandably, about what to do about things in the world that we find alarming, even at just a visceral animal level, like just disturbing, the smell of smoke in the air, let's say, or feeling so unsettled about the leadership of our tribe or band at the let's say, scale of 330 million people. That can be very unsettling if, if that is how one feels. One may not feel that way. Okay, no worries. But if one does, it can feel very unsettling. What are things about it? This is a huge question. There's so much teaching about um, how to practice with things that, one, in our view, are really genuinely bad, and two, we can't do much of anything about, right? How do we practice with that? There are a variety of things about it. Uh, one of the things that I've been trying to reflect on myself lately is to not let my concerns about the global bias my recognition of the local. In other words, we should avoid the pitfall of being all happy about the local while the rest of the world is burning or dealing with injustice. We don't want to use what I'm saying here as a way to bypass recognizing social problems, big issues, injustice, poverty, oppression, etc. But while one is clear-eyed about global issues and while one is doing what one can about those global issues, including simply knowing what you think about them, that's doing something you can. Or it might also be supporting a cause you care about one way or another. Voting when you have an opportunity to express your opinion, whether it's at the ballot box every four years maybe, or every day in how you choose to spend your money, your attention, your life's force. That's another kind of vote. So we do what we can about the global. But meanwhile, there is the local. There is the local. And it's actually often the case that what, while what is happening at the global, of whatever scale that is, which could be the entire globe, let's say in terms of global warming, climate change, um, or it could be at the national level or the cultural level or the community level, or even inside your family. You know, maybe you're really concerned about another person, your, your child or a friend or a relative. I'll call that the global. And meanwhile, alongside that, what's going on in the local? How's your, you know, can, you know, are you all right right now? 
Is breathing still going? Is there beauty around you? You know, can you help your own body in some useful way today in what you eat or how you exercise or how you move? Is there something in the local? In the local, is there someone near you that you can love the one you're with? Thank you, Stephen Stills. Uh, that you can um, be kind, if only inside your own mind, with someone who's been bugging you. Maybe it's not appropriate to say anything, but at least inside your own mind, is there something you could do in the local? So I, I, I don't, th you know, I think there are many well-developed, including theological answers to this fundamental question. You know, how do we practice with that which is a bad and b we're helpless about? Um, but one of the practices I I want to name is trying to disentangle the global from the local, and not use what's good locally to evade responsibility for what's bad globally. Don't do that. But on the other hand, um, to find what is good locally without letting your concerns about the global bias you to miss what is good in the local. So a couple of other things. You can see the chats, by the way. I'm seeing the chats as well. Um, okay. Someone says, I'm going to bring this up. And you're, it's, if you chat to everybody, I, I'll use your name from time to time. So, um, uh, okay. So this person says, I go from zero to 100 with no pause. What to do? There's a lot of teaching about this as well, right? What if you're one of those people who reacts quickly, especially to certain kinds of things. So on the, there are multiple things. One is to appreciate that quality in yourself uh, as it is applied to other things. So for example, um, if the kind of person, the same kind of person who could go from zero to 100 with anger, probably can go from zero to 100 with love or joy or happiness for cavelling, you know, happiness for the goodness and the good news in another person's life. So that's helpful right there. Second, another thing we that's useful is to be on your own side. And if you know you have that tendency, I think of it as like being a thoroughbred or a jackrabbit, being a fast reactor. Knowing that about yourself, let's say your personal car is like a Ferrari, you breathe on the gas pedal and suddenly you're going 100 miles an hour. If you just know that about your own self, choose roads <laughs> that have more straightaways, that are less bumpy and twisty turning. In other words, be careful. Avoid those situations that you know are going to trigger you. If you're triggerable, you know, you can help yourself in your practice. Third, really, 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 really calm the body. Really, really, really calm the hardware. Do the best you can about that within the limits of what you can, you know? Try to make sure you're eating reasonably consistently and well throughout the day to help your body metabolism be regulated. Be careful about sugar and the sugar crash that follows. You know, just whatever you find works for you. Try to get a lot of sleep, whatever. Maybe take vitamins, supplements, you know, that makes sense to you, uh, evidence-based, hello, uh, that are calming. And, you know, do the best you can. Calm the body. That's really, 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 really important. Okay. Third, buy yourself or fourth, buy yourself some time. The sacred pause. So, in other words, if you know that when they do that, within a second, your blood is boiling. Within 10 seconds for sure, your blood is boiling. Buy yourself more than that amount of time to find some kind of footing, right? Try to slow it down, slow it down and reserve the right to yourself to not say a word for 10 seconds or for a breath. Have a rule. You always take a big breath before you say anything when you're mad or more. Buy yourself some time, They're really good. Another is when you're triggered, talk to yourself. You know, uh, one of our kids had a friend who would say to one of our kids when they were young, remember your happy place. 
This is where we talk ourselves off the ledge. This is where we give ourselves good self-talk. Talk to yourself. There's a lot of just simply acknowledging you what you feel. There's a lot of research that shows that neurologically, when we simply note our reactions, like so mad or frozen or feeling hurt or like a little girl, where are my friends, whatever. If you can name that to yourself, just noting it, not trying to fix it, not trying to explain it, not trying to make it more or less than what it is, just this is what it's like to be me. This is what I'm experiencing right now in kind of a fair, accurate way called noting as a technique. That neurologically calms down the alarm bell of the brain, the amygdala, and increases activity in executive regions behind the forehead that give us a sense of perspective and planning. Just simply noting our own experience. That really helps too, doesn't it? Yeah. Slow it down. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground. I wanna finish really close to half past the hour. Uh, I wanna see if there's any last little comment or question. So many other ideas, by the way, many wonderful additions to what I've tried to offer here in the chat. It's kind of worth checking it out. Um, so that's good. And by the way, this recording should be posted within two days at the most, if not sooner, typically. Uh, I'll say one last one that somebody else brought up about contributing. That's the last practice, right? What's the Jewish proverb, I believe? Better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. And, or as Leonard Cohen put it, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. That's how the light gets in. So contribute. Look for ways to help. You know, turn, help as best you can in some way. That's a really good way to bind anxiety, to bind anger, to, to calm down. Really, 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 really good. All right. So let's sit together quietly, please, for a minute or so. No more chats. Just letting it sink in. What are your, what's a takeaway for you from tonight? What's a, what's a feeling you want to rest in? Or a knowing you want to have conviction about? Kind of marinating in whatever you found helpful here. Thank you very much.